Our next talk is going to be from Michael Carls from Ball State University. And the title is a two-dimensional groundwater flow modeling project. So I will give the floor to him and I hope that you all enjoy this talk. Thank you. So I'm gonna talk about a, a project that I worked on with a, a student at Ball State as an honors thesis project. It's called a two-dimensional groundwater flow modeling project. Okay, so the purpose of this project is to derive and investigate a mathematical model for two-dimensional flow of groundwater. And the model consists of a partial differential equation known as the two-dimensional groundwater flow equation as well as appropriate boundary conditions and initial data. And after finding analytical and numerical solutions to the resulting initial value boundary value problem, we're gonna compare our models by means of an example implemented in Mathematica. And the numerical computations are implemented in Excel, and like I said, this came about as a re result of an undergraduate honors thesis project at Ball State. Um, with, um, it was Juliana Baker's uh, project. So um, just an outline of what we're gonna talk about. First, we're gonna look at some groundwater basics, with Darcy's law, the idea of continuity or conservation of mass. And then we'll look at the uh, two-dimensional groundwater flow equation. We're actually gonna derive this equation. And then I'll, I'll give you an in initial problem statement. So we'll look at a mathematical and we'll look at how we collected data for this. And then we'll look at the roadblock we ran into. So then um, we'll um, then I look at a modified problem statement and the results of this problem. And then we'll look at a further investigation and some questions that have come up and then have a conclusion. Okay, so uh, th this guy here is uh, Henry Darcy. So he he's pretty uh, big in groundwater. Modeling. So in the mid 19th century, the city of Dijon, France decided to improve and enlarge the city's public waterworks. And so Henry Darcy, he was the local inspector general of bridges and roads. And he was responsible for this civil engineering program. And one of the challenges that um, was Darcy faced was how to design sand filters for the city's public fountains. And sand is an example of a material found in an aquifer, which is a body of saturated rock through which water flows easily. And th this is a video um, I found on YouTube that talks about Darcy that I show my students when I teach them this stuff. So you can uh, click on this link if you look at the talk. Well, there weren't any models for the flow of fluid through a porous medium, so Darcy had to create one. And to do this, he performed his own experiments on the flow of water through sand. And his results, including what we now know as Darcy's Law, were published in 1856 as an appendix to his uh, 647 page report on the project Le Fontan Public de la Ville de Dijon. Okay, so Darcy used an experimental setup uh, similar to the one I, I've shown here. And he determined that for one dimensional flow, the volumetric flow rate of water Q is related to the hydraulic head H, uh, which you can think of as the height of the water level relative to a reference point. A hydraulic gradient I, where um, I is equal to the change in head level between the two points we were measuring the um, water height, divided by how far apart these points are in the discrete case, or equal to um, the derivative of the respective position um, of the minus sign of the point in the continuous case for a single point, and the cross sectional area A by means of uh, U equals K times I times A, where K is a proportionality constant called the hydraulic conductivity, and that depends on the, the geologic material through which the water is flowing. And so if you use Darcy's law and the idea of continuity or conservation of mass, uh, you can derive a partial differential equation that describes water level at any point in an aquifer at any given time. And this equates a two-dimensional groundwater flow equation. So to, der to derive this uh, two-dimensional ground or floor equation, we're gonna apply the law of conservation of mass to a small rectangular solid within a larger region below the Earth's surface that contains groundwater. This region has width two delta y, length two delta x, and height delta z equals one, and the sides are parallel to the coordinate planes. So here's a little picture of what we're looking at, and the water is gonna flow from, this is like head level 100 units, and this is head level nine units. So water flows from high level to low level, so it's gonna flow this way. And we'll assume the flow in the Z direction is negligible, so we're considering only flow in the X and Y directions. So the law of conservation mass for the case of a fluid says that inflow must equal outflow, or for our specific case, 
flow in plus the flow introduced from an external source is equal to the flow out plus any change in flow due to storage in the medium. You know, we're going to assume that along, so water is going to be flowing into this rectangular region. You can think it's going to flow in this way, in this way, out this way, and out that way. And uh, we're going to assume that along the left base, for example, the outward flow of water can be represented by the flow of water at the center of the left base and make similar assumptions for the other three faces of the rectangular system. So mathematically, the conservation of mass statement becomes this expression here. What I've done is I put the um, flow terms on the right side, and, and then on the left, I have uh, terms involving uh, adding water or storage. So here, Q of xy is the volumetric flow rate. That's in units of volume per time. Um, R of xy is a recharge term. That's the volume of water added per unit time per unit aquifer area. And storage coefficient S is the volume of water released from storage per unit area of aquifer per unit decline in head. Um, S is equal to um, this quantity, delta V sub W over um, delta x, delta y, to delta h, where if you look at the delta v over delta t, that's the rate of release of a volume of water from storage. Now, if you use the two-dimensional version of Darcy's law for flux, um, that's equivalent to saying that in the x direction, the uh, flow is equal to minus k times the rate of change of head level with respect to x times the area, plus actually area in the x direction, and the flow rate in the y direction is equal to a minus of a times the derivative of h with respect to y as the cross-sectional area in the y direction, which is basically Darcy's law on just one-dimensional versions in the x and y directions. So then you can find a relation between the volumetric flow rate q and the hydraulic head, which is what we really want. So if we apply Darcy's law, our mass conservation equation becomes this. So basically, it is stuck in Darcy's law for each of the um, volumetric flow rate terms. And if you divide through by the quantity minus four times K times delta X delta Y, you get this expression here. And um, well, what you can do is you can let the change in X change in Y and change in P go to zero. And what you get is the groundwater flow equation with recharge. On the left-hand side, you have the sum of the second partial derivatives of the head level with respect to um, X and Y. On the right, you have the derivative of head level respect to time um, plus a recharge term. So if we uh, define uh, kappa to be um, thermal conductivity over the storage of coefficient, assume no water is being introduced from an external source, but letting the R term equal zero for all x, y, and t, we arrive at the two-dimensional groundwater flow equation right here. And equation one, that's the two-dimensional heat equation. It also should look like something else you might have seen. It's also the same thing as the two-dimensional. Sorry, yeah, it's the two, oops, I get it. It's the two-dimensional heat equation also. Yeah. Oh. Okay, now for Juliana's honors thesis, here's the problem that I pose. So what I, I do when I work with students is I give them a problem to work on. So I, I wanted her to find a time-dependent model for two-dimensional groundwater flow in a rectangular region. And the model should be able to predict water well head levels as a function of position, x, y, and time, t. And then find a way to measure or collect the actual well head levels and compare the model to the data from them. So the model for two-dimensional groundwater flow is the two-dimensional heat equation, equation one we saw above, with appropriate boundary conditions, initial head levels, and hydraulic diffusivity, k. What I have here is the first equation, that's the groundwater flow equation of the two-dimensional heat equation. These four terms here, that's just the head levels on the boundaries. And this term here is the initial head level at every point in the rectangular region at time zero. This is an initial value boundary value problem. So to solve problem one through six, one uses separation of variables and Fourier series methods. Uh, I'll say the solution process is straightforward, but quite involved. And so I'm just gonna give you the solution on the next slide. So it's of this form here. So on the hydraulic, um, head h, which is a function of a position x, y, and time t, is equal to function w. Um, that's a transient function plus a function v, which is a steady state solution. So here, here's the steady state solution here for v. And then here's the transient solution for w. OK, so the next part of the project was to collect wellhead data for comparison to our model. And a great source for um, wellhead data is the US Geological Survey website. Um, I'll give you a link right here. 
And so here's some data that we collected from Summit Lake State Park in Indiana. I'm collected at eight wells. And position coordinates are in meters relative to a fixed origin with wellhead levels in feet relative to a minimum head level. So here are the, here's where the wells were located. And here was the um, head levels over time, each of these wells. Okay, so then, then we um, use Mathematica to fit the um, head level data at a time we considered time zero to get a second degree polynomial to fit the initial data. And here's a contour plot of this function on the right, shown along with well locations. Okay, so at this point, we're unsure how to proceed with the boundary conditions. Not only do we not have well defined boundaries, which we need for a model, we also had time dependent boundary conditions. Okay, so at this point, what I decided to do is modify the project to one that could be completed so Juliana could graduate. Okay, so here's the modified project. Uh, for the given rectangular region on the right, suppose the head levels are known and assumed to be fixed for all times each of the wells on the boundary of the region. So what I have here is there's head level described at um, points along the boundary of this region here. And, and this is where the wells are located. Here, this is the x-coordinate, the y-coordinate. Further assume that the initial head levels of the 25 interior point wells labeled H1 through H25 are given. Use this information to find a solution to the problem one through six. So here's what Juliana did. She used Mathematica to numerically fit functions to the boundary data and chose her initial um, data function. She just picked f of x, y is x times y. And then she found an analytic solution to the steady state problem. And she solved the transient problem analytically. And she implemented the solution in Mathematica. And so here we're comparing the solution at time zero, that's the white um, plot to the initial um, head level at time zero, that's, that's the orange plane. And Juliana also found the steady, the solution of the steady state problem numerically by means of iteration in Excel. And it turns out that's a computationally more efficient and requires only given boundary data. And, com and combining this new steady state solution with the original transient solution, she did that. And she implemented this combination solution in Mathematica. And then she used Mathematica to compare both the both solutions she found, the analytic and the combination solution. So here you have a plot where she's comparing um, both solutions graphically to show that they're close. So here's some further questions that came out of this project. Is there a way to find appropriate fixed boundary conditions for the original problem? And so one possibility is to look at outermost wells and choose boundary conditions based on these wells. Um, for example, maybe average well head level or maximum level, et cetera. Another approach may be to assume boundaries are far away from the given data and unknown. And then you can try a set of boundary conditions, solve, revise the boundary conditions, resolve, and compare solutions. And this, this idea comes from um, a paper on groundwater modeling and numerical models by Faust and Mercer. And regardless of the approach, most likely seasonal fluctuation of data needs to be accounted for, um, perhaps a periodic forcing term in the model would help. So, so after Juliana got done with her thesis, um, I set this aside and then actually revisited it in 2017. And uh, I, I had, um, I guess, discovered like, how do you deal with time of dependent boundary conditions. And so here's a revised model that addresses um, if you have boundary conditions that actually are a function of time. So it's the same um, heat equation for a model and the same initial um, data function. And then for the boundary conditions, we're including not just position, but time. Each of the boundaries is a function of position and time, the boundary conditions. So to solve this revised initial value boundary value problem, um, one shifts the boundary data, uses separation variables and Fourier series methods, and the solution process is I'm going to say straightforward, in quotes, but more involved than the last model. And the key is to decompose the solution into a sum of a function that satisfies the time-dependent boundary conditions and a function that satisfies homogeneous boundary conditions. Okay, so here's the solution. Okay, so it, it's of the form that I'm going to say a steady state solution in quotes because it's actually a function of time. That's this S function plus this uh, tr 
essentially it's the analog, it's the transient solution here. So th this is the solution when you have time dependent boundary conditions, which I'd say is slightly more complicated than what we saw before. Okay, so um, we need us, I needed some data um, for this project. So I used the um, original set of data chosen by Juliana. And then I fit the head levels at wells, um, the outermost wells. So G is right here. B1 is here, the square. And up here in the upper right-hand corner, that's um, B1. So what I did is I use the, I, I I'm fit the head levels to functions that I actually looked at planes for each time T going through those points. Um, and then I um, created time dependent boundary conditions. And so here's a picture like at, at some instant in time, but I just ran, I just ran a plane through each of those three um, head levels at the three boundary wells. And so the next step is to solve the steady state problem with time dependent boundary conditions. And this solution will be used as a part of the transient solution. And I tried this in Mathematica and discovered solutions are messy and computationally slow. And then I pretty much stopped because <laughs> I wasn't sure what to do at that point. So I'd say at this point, more work is needed. Uh, but this did generate some further questions. Like, can we get a solution that works in Mathematica? Can we make it computationally um, efficient? Um, how well will the solution compare to the measured data? We hadn't gotten that far. Or another question, are there set data sets that would be more appropriate or easier to work with? So um, in conclusion, groundwater flow models provide an application of the heat equation that is different than what is typically presented in textbooks. And the results of this modeling project show promise for modeling investigations that can be performed in a classroom setting. In addition, the initial project, the 2017 project, and further questions raised provide a source for potential future undergraduate research. And here's just a list of sources that I used uh, for stuff related in this class. So thank you. Any questions? We did finish a little early. So if you have questions for Michael, feel free to ask them right now. Thank you for that talk. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead with a question then or a comment, I guess. Um, so you, one of the things you mentioned was that the problem that you were looking at had no actual physical boundary. And how do you know what the boundary conditions are? Um, and you suggested one alternative would be to uh, make the boundaries really far away. So if you're going to make the boundaries really far away, what I would recommend is that you make the boundary really far away in just one direction. Okay. And instead of making it far away to a, at a finite value, make it infinity. Okay. Uh, and then you could do a, a Fourier transform in that one direction. I don't know whether that would make the uh, implementation of the solution any easier or harder, uh, but it, it would be analytically solvable. Uh, okay. it, would, it would add different mathematics, so you'd be doing a combination of, of um, well, I guess you wouldn't need separation of variables because uh, you'd only have an OD. You'd only have an ODE after you did the Fourier transform. Okay. We can talk about that later. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions from the talk or anything else that they'd like to bring to the speaker's attention? Feel free to put in the chat as well if you feel more comfortable doing so. Marka, so what, what was the problem you encountered in Mathematica? It just seemed like it was, the, the solution seemed quite complicated and I, and it just, it took a long, it took forever to calculate. And so I wasn't able to get the thing to calculate fast enough to, um, yeah, that's because probably one of the things that I don't know what technique you are utilizing it, um, the numerical, I mean, again, these are, you are going into a numerical mother, am I right? Well, I actually, what I use, I have an analytic solution. So what I do is I just uh, chop up the series, uh -huh. take, a, take a partial sum and just do calculations with that. So I would have... Uh, so, and, and I, I calculate all the coefficients. Um, it's just uh -huh. I have to do it for each instant in time. And uh, so, you know, so I'm, I'm looking at, you know, each time I choose, I have to calculate all the coefficients for that time and then do it again mm -hmm. uh, for, for the next time. And, and so it just seemed like 
it was just a mess. It took it took a lot of lot of time, and I I I just decided that I didn't know what to do, so I stopped. <laughs> That's what I usually do with things that when I'm working on them, and I'm not sure, I just stop and, and let it percolate for a while. Yeah, I mean, you know, probably one of the method, you know, basic basic method of numerical techniques to try and see, um, you know, with a grid point. I mean, I don't know at this level what kind of students you have, their numerical techniques and uh, their intricacies of the, you know, difficulty in numerical error analysis and all the. When you're calculating the coefficient or you're going up to a certain number of infinite series, probably an approximation problem leads to um, some, you know, difficulty in the solution and uh, analytical. But that's where analytical method probably have to change to a numerical method. Yeah, and so four years, definitely four year series, definitely will. It's a usual way to do that. Mm -hmm. But many of these problems, especially when you're dealing with uh, unsteady flow, you know? And again, I'm also facing, I'm working on a similar kind of a problem, not in terms of a, you know, this application, a similar kind of situation comes in um, something called a glass transition temperature. <laughs> the same, same issue comes in. We try to look at, you know, the infinity um, there we are not unable to find a amicable solution because we only have experimental data from the industries. Uh, similar kind of equation. We try to look at an ex you know, this one we extended to do a different stage, a nonlinear PDE, but that is much more messy. But we wanted to, before it get into nonlinear, we want to come to steady state linear PDE what you are looking at that way. Yeah, sometimes um, boundary condition is going to dictate, especially initial condition going to dictate, you added an F of XT, you know, the time series. So maybe, you know, analytical techniques uh, should be able to work in a reasonable boundary conditions, but I don't know, as you change your initial and boundary condition, it could dictate whether the analytical is giving us a correct answer or may I have to approach a numerical methods. Mathematica, you can also uh, dictate uh, different techniques, you know. In the Mathematica command, you can say, I wanted to utilize this one, I wanted to utilize that method, and you can dictate that one. Okay. You may have to prescribe a method uh, in the mathematical routine. Thank you. Thank you. Very good presentation. I like it. Uh, can I jump in again? Uh, yeah, okay. So another thing that you could do uh, that would be probably more computationally feasible uh, would be to do a numerical solution. Um, usually it's easier for our computers to calculate numerical solutions than it is for them to evaluate an analytical solution. Yeah. Yep. So if you don't have experience in that, I can tell you what, what, I, what I would look up for, for what to do. Okay. There's a method called the method of lines in yep. which you make a grid uh, in space and you assign a, a, a variable subscript to each point in the grid. And then you use um, finite difference approximations to indicate how the points in the grid are related. And what you end up with then is a large system of ordinary differential equations, one mm -hmm. for each point in the grid. Mm -hmm. And so then, then you can use a built-in ODE solver uh, to, to do the integration. Okay, cool. If, if you're using, uh, okay, I'll jump in. If you're using ODE, try to use ODE 45 from uh, either MATLAB or MATLAB. MATLAB I always liked, um, MATLAB in that respect. Mathematica is great. I should not say that. No, no. I worked with the Stephen Wolfram for a quite long time. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. If you're going to do it numerically, it would be better to use MATLAB than to use a computer algebra system. Computer algebra systems are not designed 
for for really efficient numerical evaluation, whereas MATLAB is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you didn't hear from me, okay? Because I worked with the Stephen for a long. <laughs> Well, well, thank you. Yeah, because I, I, everything I've done is, is I look at analytic solutions. I, I've tried to, I mean, that's, that's the world I live in, you know, but I, I appreciate yeah. the suggestions in the numerical world. Yeah, so I, I've always tried to do things in the analytical world. I'm aware that most of the stuff is done numerically, but um, just yeah, finite difference is a great way of an initial right. startup. Yeah. If you, once you know the linear systems and, you know, OD, it's very easy to do that. I mean, even a senior undergraduate students can help you, you know, into that one. Well, yeah. that, that probably would be the next project. You know, if a student wants yeah. to work on this again, I, we just explore that um, and see, see that, where that leads us, so. Yeah. That's I mean, in the 21st. Sorry, you can continue. In the 21st century, and I would say that the young children generation, at least a little bit knowing finite differences are great things because it will be useful for many other applications. Thank you for that. I'm sorry for interrupting earlier. I just wanted to let everyone know that the session is coming to the end. But thank you again to our presenter and thank you for everyone who came and asked the questions. Um, and I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your time at the conference today. Thank you.